Yeah, my name is Jalal Baris. I'm a PGY1 in neurology. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing just uh, perioperative pain management. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Black for supervising the project. And then uh, thanks to Dr. Raymond Tang from Anesthesia for also helping me out. So uh, learning objectives. I'm going to go over the importance of perioperative pain control and uh, its impact on patient outcomes. I'm also going to be looking over uh, uh, what is chronic post-surgical pain and how it's related to perioperative pain control. I'm going to review different strategies for perioperative analgesia and then review post-operative prescription practices in neurology. This is an outline of my presentation. So uh, like I said, I'm going to start off with the importance of effective pain management. I'll then discuss um, assessing post-operative pain. Uh, what different types of pains are, um, what is chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, then uh, I'll start off with some non-pharmacological strategies, then some pharmacological uh, strategies, then some anesthetic strategies, and finally some post-op opioid prescription uh, uh, protocols. So uh, I've broken down the uh, the importance of uh, bibliography pain uh, management to three categories. Uh, the first one being the patient. So these are the effects of the, on the patient's perspective and experience of the healthcare system. So the, the most common concern mentioned by patients preoperatively when you see them in eMERGE or in, in uh, pre-op is um, how bad is the pain going to be? Uh, how long is the recovery going to be? Uh, how painful is the recovery going to be? So inadequate pain control perioperatively can lead to patient decreased quality of life, delayed recovery, sleep disturbance, and prolonged time to mobilization, uh, increased opioid dependence, and even potentially surgically regret, uh, surgical regret. Um, the next is the effects on the hospital. What I mean here is um, poor pain management is a common cause for prolonged length of stay. And so uh, and if the patient is discharged, it's a common cause for uh, return visits to the emergency department post-op. Uh, it obviously increases the, the load on the healthcare system and also has its economic effects. Uh, lastly, here I have the medical consequences or what I mean by that is um, a crucial part of enhanced recovery protocols like ERAS is adequate post-op pain control. Um, if your pain management isn't optimized, you can't really expect adequate um, an early mobilization. You can't expect uh, adequate PO intake, and uh, especially if a patient's high, requiring high-dose opioids with the uh, sluggish side effects of, of opioids. Um, we've seen a couple of cases of prolonged hospital stay and, and uh, deteriorating delirium as well post-op. And a common note we get from geriatricians when we consult them is to, to better control the patient's pain. Um, we also see uh, lots of our patients, <clears throat> the next uh, person they see after us post-op is usually their family doctors being followed up in their clinics. And so um, uh, inadequate point of pain control, you get, you get mismanagement of their pain and, and potentially unwarranted investigations and interventions in uh, either the emergency department or... Um, their family doctor's office. Um, and lastly, as I said, uncontrolled pa uh, postoperative pain delays recovery after surgery, including delayed mobilization. And when coupled with prolonged opioid use, um, uh, when coupled with prolonged opioid use, it can cause uh, significant delay in bowel function. And then lastly here, I mentioned chronic post-surgical pain, which I, I go into more detail later on about. So this is how you, you uh, um, assess uh, post-operative pain or pain in general is assessed on the ward. So when nurses assess patients, they're, they're, observing, they're observing the patient, they're looking at physiological changes like their vital signs, hypertension, tachycardia. They use uh, the FACES pain scale shown here on the right. Uh, they ask patients to, raise, to rate their, their pain from one to 10. They ask about the location of the pain, the intensity of the pain. And then typically that's when they page us. So, um, uh, when uh, nur nurses are trained to, to treat pain when it's rated a 4 out of 10 or higher, and typically when it fails, whatever treatment is ordered, that's when they call us. Um, the sort of things we hear our patient is, is tearful, patient's not responding to pain medication, patient is not tolerant, tolerating uh, movement, patient's complaining of pain, uh, patient is delirious. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there are sometimes obstacles to the patient communicating pain, which is why we look at these, these uh, 
uh, factors other than self-reported pain. And uh, this uh, FACES pain scale on the right is actually validated for adults across uh, multiple studies across different cultures and countries. Um, yeah. Um, another, uh, so the reason why I mentioned this, this pain scale is just because a lot of the studies I'm going to mention later use this scale from zero to 10 or the face pain scale to, to assess how, uh, how well a patient is doing postoperatively. Another questionnaire that they do use is the, the McGill pain questionnaire. And I'm not going to go into too many detail, uh, into it just because not, not many studies use it, but, uh, essentially it, it uses 78 different descriptor words. Um, which is grouped into 20 subclasses, which are then grouped into four subscales. And essentially, they um, they describe the pain more accurately rather than just giving an intensity of the pain from zero to 10. It also describes it um, using names like uh, words like uh, cramping, tugging, pricking, tingling, spreading, etc. Um, so, what are the types of, of uh, perioperative pain? So, um, Acute pain is typically right after surgery, lasts up to up to seven days. And if uh, pain persists more than three months, it's it's considered chronic pain. Um, pain is important. It's uh, it's a uh, it provides a warning of tissue damage and uh, uh, it induces immobilization to allow for for the body to heal. Um, Postoperative pain can be categorized into nociceptive, inflammatory, and neuropathic. Um, uh, nociceptive pain is, is from activated unmyelinated C fibers and thinly myelinated A delta fibers. And uh, it's secondary to, to intense mechanical, chemical, or thermal stimuli. So essentially the, the actual surgery part, the incision, the dissection. It's quite time limited and fairly, it responds fairly well to opioids. Um, next, you get the inflammatory pain. So that's that's the amplified nociceptive fiber response from, from, uh, from uh, inflammatory mediators like cytokines. And that's when you get the classic uh, pain, heat, erythema, swelling. And that's usually three to five days post-op. And then you have the neuropathic pain. So that's uh, from, in terms of surgery, typically direct nerve, nervous system injury. And uh, that's usually chronic in nature. And, and it's not going to last just a few days. And it's not going to be responding to opioids as well. On the right here is just a cool diagram that shows uh, where different interventions um, uh, would intervene um, and uh, so like local anesthetics and anti-inflammatory drugs we use typically target the nociceptive receptors and opioids and alpha-2 agonists are targeting higher up typically. So uh, in a previous slide, I mentioned uh, a, a consequence of poor acute pain control is um, uh, chronic post-surgical pain. Um, so in, in, uh, in the 2000, a literature review by Perkin et al. identified numerous surgeries that have significantly higher patient reported pain that persists beyond the acute post-op period. The classic ones they detail uh, is uh, thoracotomies, breast surgeries, amputations with uh, like phantom limb pain and inguinal surgeries. Uh, but since then, this persistent pain acknowledged as, as chronic post-surgical pain uh, is considered a troublesome surgical outcome. And it's been, uh, it has varying incidence rates just because uh, it depends on how they're, they're defined. But classically, they're defined with these four criteria. So it's pain that's developed after a surgical procedure. It's uh, all other causes of the pain have been excluded. The possibility that it's from a pre-existing uh, uh, issue has, has been excluded, and the timeline is typically that it's it's uh, either three months post-op or six up to six months post-op. Um, typically, it's, um, it's described as uh, secondary to ongoing inflammation versus neuropathic pain, or uh, usually a mix of both. And various studies looking into this concept has since have since associated the the control and severity of of pain in, in the acute post-op period uh, with the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. Um, it's also thought to correlate with increased uh, opioid use, which is uh, thought to be secondary to opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is when you have increased perception of pain after uh, the use of opioids perioperatively. Uh, and since then, uh, various studies have shown uh, a decrease in, in chronic uh, post-surgical pain with uh, alternative methods for perioperative pain control. So a lot of the, the what I'm going to be discussing today is, is uh, methods to decrease uh, uh, perioperative uh, opioid uh, opioid uses, both uh, to decrease the chance of, of uh, developing chronic post surgical pain, as well as to decrease the the negative effects that we we see with the opioid usage, uh, delaying function and, and delaying recovery. 
So in, in urology, it's, there's not much in the current literature about chronic post-surgical pain in urology. There's a study uh, that looked at uh, nephrectomies in 2006 that showed that about, about 20% of all patients uh, in their study had, had pain still at the six-month mark. Um, another study quoted 9% at the six-month mark. And then uh, as for retropubic uh, radical prostatectomies, uh, it varies from study to study, but from, from 10% to about 49% at the three-month mark, and then 10% to 30% at the six-month mark. So as you see, the, the, the numbers are vary quite a bit, and, and um, um, there's not much evidence in, in neurology about chronic post-surgical pain. It's not well investigated. And uh, there's also not much about the... Uh, about uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery side of things. It's mostly focused on major abdominal surgeries. And we can assume those are the ones probably more, more associated with, with worse pain. So I'm gonna start by talking about uh, uh, preoperative and then uh, perioperative and then postoperative considerations for controlling pain. So we'll start off with preoperative. So, so patient factors that have been linked to increased post-op pain. So I'm gonna analysis in, in um, uh, by a young et al. used about 50,000 patients, over 33 studies across the world, interpreting what uh, preoperative predictors are for poor uh, acute post-op pain control. And uh, most of the studies use that 10-point pain system uh, or pain scale and uh, considered a four or above to be high significant pain. And then looking in the, uh, and they looked at the first 24 to 48 hours post-op. It found different factors like uh, younger age, uh, females, increased BMI, Active smoking uh, defined as smoked within the last year uh, to have increased post-operative pain. It also found uh, that a history of depression and anxiety correlated with worse post-op pain. And then as expected, uh, having a complex pain history or uh, uh, preoperative chronic analgesia use was found to have worse pain control. Um, these psychological and pre-existing factors might not always be modifiable, but they, they should be recognized and addressed to the greatest extent possible by, by patient education, counseling, and, and encouragement, uh, which I'm, I'm going to go more into in the next slide. Um, and just a note about differences in ethnicities. Multiple studies have been conducted to evaluate, to evaluate the difference in post-op pain across ethnicities. Uh, there's a study, Pullman et al. found that uh, that Black women experienced higher po uh, post-op pain after C-sections than white women. Uh, Watson et al. found that um, South Asian men experience more pain uh, post-op than white British men. And uh, uh, a meta-analysis looked at 32 studies um, by Thurston et al. and found that, that uh, racial minorities in general have higher pain scores on average compared to white counterparts. Uh, and they attributed largely to the discrepancy in pain control. So uh, typically minorities are given an, on average less morphine equivalents. Uh, despite higher pain scores. All right, so speaking of preoperative expectations, the, 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 um, the first step to perioperative pain management is, is, is essentially preoperative education. So patient education plays an important role by encouraging patients to, to participate in their recovery. So ensuring that patients have adequate surgery, what their postoperative course is going to look like, and it ensures that they actually follow their treatment plans. Uh, so there's actually a study in 2023 by Benabi et al. that uh, reviewed preoperative pain education and a variety of methods by a variety of surgeons. And um, they they uh, essentially summarized, uh, the, to summarize, they found that patient education led by the surgeon, coupled with a written handout uh, before the surgery, uh, showed significantly less post-op pain compared to control groups. Um, essentially, surgeons sat with the patients and, and uh, uh, described how their body will respond to pain after a surgery, what to expect in terms of pain, and um, uh, details specific to their disease and how that affects pain, and general postoperative care and recovery, and going through the ERAS protocol and early mobilization, the importance of its uh, early bowel function. The paper also studied that uh, also the paper also showed that uh, uh, studies that used only videos or only handouts without the the in-person explanation by a surgeon had no difference in post-op pain levels. And uh, one study actually looked at, a, they used a one-hour lecture from uh, uh, led by, by nursing staff and uh, compared to no education at all, actually found uh, uh, higher post-op pain by, uh, levels by post-op day seven. 
Um, and then when it comes to opioid use, uh, multiple studies showed that even just a, a brief video educating on safe opioid use, non-opioid approaches to, to management of pain significantly decreased opioid consumption post-op uh, with no changes to post-op pain levels. And um, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the uh, the education given to our patients prior to surgeries, um, but it's it's uh, for, from our perspective on on the ward, it's not uncommon that we get asked for a hydromorph prescription post op just in case we get asked uh, some information regarding opioids. Uh, so um, yeah, some some information given in, in clinic preoperatively, as well as perhaps some some written information regarding expected stages of pain and uh, what isn't isn't normal may help prepare patients for what is to come and. Uh, we do commonly mention it to patients that discharge, and we include it on discharge summaries. Um, but based on this data, it's preemptively educating patients will probably help foster realistic expectations. Um, on the right here is just a, an outline kind of the ERAS protocol. And um, an integral part of it is, is uh, finding methods for optimizing pain control. And so this helps achieve the goal of hastening recovery and shortening length of stay by, by promoting early mobilization, for example. And uh, a lot of different methods I'll be speaking about today aim, like I said, to decrease opioid consumption while maintaining optimal pain control, to avoid the sluggish effects of opioids without sacrificing patient outcomes or patient satisfaction or, or pain control. So other than patient education, what are some other non-pharmacological methods uh, to control pain? Uh, most of the data out there revolves around managing chronic pain, not so much post-surgical pain without uh, with non-pharmacological methods. Uh, but a study in 2019 looked over a huge chunk of data from over 14,000 patients from a post-operative pain registry called PainOut, and uh, it divided uh, non-pharmacological methods into uh, into four categories. So passive physical, that's stuff like like acupuncture and massage and heat and cold packs. And I actually found acupuncture has little to no effects. There's no clinical significance in, in the surgical setting. Um, uh, separate from the chronic pain setting. Uh, there are mixed studies about cold packs. One, one study showed that, that cold packs and, and um, uh, pressure dressings were, were, had similar effects after knee surgeries. Um, next is the physical. So physical activities like walking, deep breathing, moderate level sport activities. And um, the study couldn't find any data on post-op and, and uh, on, uh, for pain management. And honestly, I looked and I couldn't find any either. Uh, next is psych or spiritual, so um, uh, imagery, visualization, a positive visualization, and, and uh, relaxation, meditation, praying. Uh, very limited post-op pain management differences found. Um, it's not very consistent throughout multiple studies. And then lastly, things like distractions, so watching TV, listening to music, talking to people. A small-scale study showed that performing memory tasks may have some benefits, and uh, another small-scale study showed that music shows some minimal statistic improvement in pain, but not really clinically significant. So, uh, summarize, not, not much uh, significant data is out there. So now we'll, we'll start off with the, with the drugs, so um, pharmacological methods of controlling pain. Uh, so... Uh, We'll start off with NSAIDs. Given the the primary driver for most post-operative pain in the acute period is uh, is, infl uh, is inflammation, uh, so anti-inflammatories in a sense are probably a good idea to control it. Um, a big advantage of using NSAIDs is that it's it's been proven to have an opioid sparing effect, uh, decreasing or limiting the need for opioids post-op. Uh, this avoids the risk of of opioid hyperalgesia that I talked about, but also all the sluggish side effects of opioids that affect. Uh, uh, early function and uh, early recovery, and um, uh, early and also avoids hopefully dependence on on opioids. Uh, this study in 2005, they divided about a thousand patients into two groups. So one group received only morphine post op, and um, uh, another group received the uh, ketorolac followed by morphine PRN. And they assessed the pain about 30 minutes post op, and kept assessing it for the first couple of hours. And the study showed that pain is actually actually worse in the first 30 minutes for patients that uh, receive ketorolac first. So that's what you see in the graph here. Um, uh, and then uh, overall, the, 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 the um, opioid requirements were significantly less in the ketorolac group. Um, and after those 30 minutes, the, there was no real significant difference in, in pain control between the ketorolac and the morphine group. And when we talk about NSAIDs and, and ketorolac, um, the, the main 
consequences we we talk about are, are usually the post op uh, increased risk of post op bleeding and then its effects on GFR. So, uh, ketorolac is a COX inhibitor, which uh, theoretically has its effects on platelet aggregation. Uh, however, in an analysis in 2014, uh, looked at 27 different articles over 2,000 patients. They found no statistical significance in, uh, in terms of post-op bleeding, uh, while actually offering better pain control uh, compared to opioids um, and uh, decreased uh, opioid consumption post-op. And in terms of the effect on GFR, theoretically, it, it uh, and says worsen renal perfusion by inhibiting synthesis of prostaglandins, which basically dilate and, and better perfuse the kidney. Um, so it decreases perfusion to the kidney. Uh, but a, a large scale uh, retrospective cohort study in, in 1997 compared to 10,000 10, courses of IV ketorolac to 10,000 courses of IV opioids. I found uh, no real difference um, in terms of. Uh, kidney function until after uh, it exceeded five days. So ketorolac is usually, is, is, um, uh, causes a high rate of AKI only when the course was over five days. And this has been uh, uh, noted in, in numerous studies since. So one interesting concept I came across is using ketorolac in donor nephrectomies where we're typically the most cautious. So this study at Mount Sinai uh, from 1996 to 2014 uh, followed kidney donors all given ketorolac and they followed them at, um, at the 24-hour, 48-hour, one week, one year, and up to five years post-op, looking at their hemoglobins and, and, and creatinine. And uh, they showed no significant difference in creatinine up until five years post-op. Um, in terms of the, the risk of post-op bleeding, the, the only uh, significant difference they found that I outlined here is uh, during the first 48 hours, the, the Ketorolac group had a lower hemoglobin statistically, um, but it was deemed clinically insignificant because there was no difference in complications. There's no difference in clinical ins uh, stability. So they concluded it was, it was actually safe to use it in kidney donors. Uh, another note I just added here um, is uh, the use of, of uh, preemptive ketorolac. So administering IV ketorolac just prior to the surgery. The Cochrane uh, uh, anesthesia group reviewed uh, 71 RCTs and found low certainty evidence of mild improvement in acute post-op pain and some evidence of, of decreased uh, opioid consumption in the first 24 hours. But uh, they didn't really comment on chronic pain or bowel function or, or recovery. And um, their conclusion is that there was no clinically significant effects of preemptively giving Torolac pre-op. Uh, next drug I'm going to talk about is ketamine. So, um, Ketamine is an MDMA uh, antagonist. It's been shown to decrease the tolerance to opioids post-op uh, by modulating opiate receptors. Uh, it's commonly used with uh, general anesthetic inductions and, and maintenance, as well as for sedation for procedures and for uh, post-op pain control. as a very rapid uh, onset of action. And um, the, the main side effects with, with ketamine is the psychoto, uh, psy psychotomimetic effects. So patients having uh, hallucinations or bad dreams and uh, benzodiazepines are used usually to improve these symptoms. Um, uh, they're actually included apparently in the, in the, in the order sets for ketamine um, on Cerner. Uh, but yet, despite this, some patients still don't, uh, don't tolerate ketamine. So why do we talk about ketamine? So this, this study in 2013 looked at uh, 60 patients undergoing lumbar surgery and divided them into three groups. Uh, so two different doses of ketamine and then uh, a saline control. And so they looked at the pain within the first 48 hours post-op as well as opioid consumption. And they found that the, the patients who received a ketamine infusion at uh, two microgram per kilogram per minute had a um, significant decrease of post-op fentanyl use with no increase in side effects or no increase in pain levels using the one to 10 pain score. Um, so theoretically it's, it's, it's uh, because of its effects on, on the toler tolerating and the effects of, of opioids, it's uh, decreasing fentanyl consumption. Another study in 2010 looked at over hundred patients undergoing lumbar surgery, all of which had a history of opiate dependent chronic pain. And uh, they divided them into two groups, one receiving ketamine infusion and the other one saline for control, with uh, fentanyl being used PRN as breakthrough for both groups. And it found that patients who received a ketamine infusion used 37% less morphine in the first 48 hours and had a 26% reduction in pain intensity six, uh, up to six weeks post-op. And then uh, another study in 2022 meta-analysis of, of nine RCTs looked at 800 post-op 
opioid uh, using patients, so patients that, that use opioids regularly, and found that ketamine infusion reduced cumulative opioid consumption post-op and consequently, obviously, reduced um, opioid-related uh, side effects uh, within the first 24 hours of surgery. So in, in conclusion, it seems like ketamine is a, is a great way to decrease dependency on opioids in the acute post-surgical period. And uh, none of these studies really commented on whether or not it would help on in, in the ERAS uh, enhanced recovery and whether or not it was decreased uh, length of stay. But we can assume given less opioids, probably has some benefit to, to patient recovery. Um, and there weren't really any studies on, on ketamine neurology that I could find. Um, I have seen CPAS use it sometimes. It might be worth considering it more consistently, especially with, with patients with complex pain histories. Uh, here I break down just a smattering of other kind of common post-op uh, non-opioid analgesics. So first off, ibuprofen. Uh, so although IV ibuprofen is, is shown to be non-inferior infer inferior to IV Ketorolac, we don't really have access to IV ibuprofen here in, in Canada, or at least in, in BC that I know of. And uh, using PO is not as effective as IV uh, Ketorolac. Um, next is, is Tylenol, so acetaminophen. Uh, not many studies look at IV. Again, it's not a big thing here in Canada. Um, most studies show that that IV acetaminophen anyways only has similar effects to PO, just a quicker onset of action. And essentially studies looking at acetaminophen versus um, Ketorolac or NSAIDs found that uh, using them in combination decreased opioid consumption and pain levels far more than using either one of them alone. Um, and uh, when pitting them against IV Ketorolac, obviously it was more, more effective than just using oral acetaminophen. And then lastly, gabapentin. Um, so, uh, this one study looked at over 800,000 patients, um, uh, post knee or, or hip replacements and, uh, were given either, uh, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, uh, or, or gabapentin or some combination of two or, or one of them and, um, or all of them. And it showed that gabapentin alone or with a single combination increased rates of, uh, of post-op, uh, pulmonary complications, but they found that combining all three, so an NSAID, some acetaminophen and some gabapentin post-op all uh, had the highest opioid sparing effect and had less pulmonary complications. Uh, next, uh, I looked at post-op pain from, from ureteric stents. So um, uh, these studies all use the USSQ, which is a, a validated measure to evaluate symptoms and impact on quality of life of ureteric stents. Um, uh, it's a questionnaire essentially that evaluates stuff like like urinary symptoms, pain score, work performance, sexual performance, and um, so the the benefits of using Flomax and Oxybutynin, for example, are, are well known for decreasing pain from stents. This one study in 2016 compared using Flomax uh, and Oxybutynin versus both together, and found that a combination of both significantly uh, better results in in terms of urinary symptoms and sexual plus work performance or self-reported compared to either one of them alone. And then uh, Lee et al. conducted a study where uh, they gave patients belladonna suppositories prior to ureteroscopies and stent insertions. And they found that administering a belladonna suppository directly before inserting a stent uh, significantly increased quality of life scores in terms of dysuria, work performance um, from, uh, from po reported post-op day three up until the stents were removed. And uh, they didn't see any cases of urinary retention. And they also didn't really see a, a decrease in the number of uh, patients that returned or emerge. Uh, it was just the self-reported quality of life that improved. Uh, so now that I've gone, oops, there we go. Uh, so now that I've gone through all the, the meds um, that I wanted to go through, uh, I'm gonna go through some, some anesthetic strategies. So uh, in the early 2000s, the MASTER trial or the multi-center Australian study of epidural anesthesia trial, and major surgery uh, demonstrated the benefits of using an epidural anesthesia for improving post-operative pain control and for reducing the rate of respiratory failure in high-risk patients undergoing major intra-abdominal surgery. And since then, epidurals have been the gold standard for analgesia after major abdominal surgery. And um, this image on the right is pretty cool. It just shows uh, where an epidural is inserted for various different surgeries. Uh, classically, the, the, the landmarks for for inserting epidurals are just the, the root of the spine uh, of the scapula is T3, the inferior angle of the scapula is T7. Uh, they also just find L3, L4 from between the iliac crest and count up. And um, uh, for radical cystectomies, the, they typically block T9 to T11. And um, 
the the issues with with epidurals are so uh, they um uh, the insertion of epidurals quite require expertise and, and have a failure rate of about 20 to 30 percent uh that i found um but yeah epidurals are inserted local anesthetics are used sometimes uh, with or without opioids and uh, the idea is getting a, a sensory block while still being able to mobilize allows the patient to hopefully recover quicker um uh, being able to mobilize without without the pain hindering their their early mobilization. Um, uh, the uh, epidurals theoretically can provide analgesia without the systemic effects of opioids and uh, thus reducing post-op ileus um, as well. And uh, the classic side effects include urinary retention, hypotension, uh, potential motor block hindering mobility, and the uh, dangerous, albeit rare, side effects include like uh, hematoma formation, epidural abscess, and neural damage. Uh, and lastly, the contraindications to, to epidurals are patient refusal, raised intracranial pressure, and infection, infection wherever they want to stick the epidural in, and then anticoagulation. So the, the first study I want to look at is, is uh, for epidurals, looks at patients being given um, uh, either uh, just a PCA and just IV analgesics compared to uh, receiving an epidural either just post-op or intraoperatively or both. Um, uh, they, they essentially divided 85 patients into, into four different groups. And um, the first group just received IV analgesics and um, uh, second group I received IV intraop and then epidural post-op and a mix of either one of these for groups one through four. And um, uh, they then looked at the demands using a, a PCA. Um, uh, they used that the, they looked at demand of a PCA for, and the PCEA for, for epidurals at 12 hours, 12, 24 hours, 48 and 72 hours. So that's what the top graph looks at essentially is the difference in, in, uh, in pain using uh, the PCA uh, at those time marks. And then uh, they looked at residual or chronic pain post-op at two weeks, one month, six months, and 12 months. So essentially what they found is that during the hospital stay, um, group one, which received no uh, epidural at all, just all IV, uh, had significantly higher pain compared to all other groups. And this essentially continues through until until up to six months post-op, uh, with group one reporting reporting more residual pain compared to all other groups. And uh, the groups that received uh, epidural intraoperatively, so groups three and four, um, had uh, no residual pain at all at six months um, and at one year, essentially showing that epidural use for analgesia intraoperatively has significant effect on chronic post-surgical pain, and that the use of epidurals at any point uh, actually uh, significantly improves um, uh, acute pain management. Um, so while epidural catheters are the gold standard or considered the gold standard for surgeries with midline incisions, uh, rectal sheath catheters are also an option for patients refusing or for patients contraindicated for epidurals. Essentially, the, the catheters are inserted via, usually, typically through ultrasound guidance, uh, right after GA induction, or uh, potentially through uh, intraoperatively through, uh, prior to the incision uh, closure and uh, within the rectal sheath and, and continuously pump uh, local anesthetic to the area. Um, under the ultrasound, essentially, they they find the uh, uh, the linea alba, and then they they these two parallel lines are essentially the uh, um, uh, the, the transversalis fascia um, and the um, uh, the posterior rectus sheath, and essentially the the right between uh, right uh, posterior to them is the potential space where they they pump in the local anesthetic. The, the surgical approach to the insertion is uh, uh, employed in a study here in Vancouver that I'll talk about, where the, the plane is found by dissection from the midline incision. Um, the idea is to, to provide adequate pain relief by blocking the intercostal nerves supplying to the, the anterior abdominal wall while avoiding the potential side effects of, of epidurals. So numerous studies have been performed in, in varying surgeries that establish non-inferiority when comparing rectal sheath catheters to epidurals. So um, Yasin et al., they compared um, epidurals to rectal sheath catheters, uh, both using only a local anesthetic, both into the, the epidural and the rectal sheath catheter, uh, in post-op elective laparotomies. And they found that less people with uh, less patients in the rectal sheath catheter group required morphine in the first 72 hours. However, when they did require morphine, the rectal sheath catheter usually asked for it quicker. And when they did more, it did need morphine, they used a lot more. Um, they also found that the rectal sheath catheter group mobilized quicker than the epidural group. And then Sodar et al. in uh, 2021 compared epidurals to rectal sheath catheters in, uh, in AAA repairs. 
and they found that rectal sheath catheters had a shorter uh, length of stay and mobilized earlier, and there was no difference in pain control. And then lastly, Craig et al. compared uh, uh, thoracic epidurals with opioids and local anesthetic injected through them first compared to, uh, to rectal sheath catheters and post-op laparotomies. And uh, you can see here in the graph, they showed that in the first 24 hours, um, rectal sheath catheter group had actually worse pain, but then over time, uh, it was... Um, uh, the rectus catheter had significantly less than epidurals uh, at the 72-hour mark. Um, uh, they also found that uh, the epidural group used more morphine on average and had the consequence of hypotension that wasn't found in the rectal sheath catheter group. So essentially, to, to summarize, it seems that rectal sheath catheters have similar pain control with, with better recovery, although opioid consumption alone seems to vary from study to study. Uh, I haven't been able to find anything regarding follow-up months after the surgery to assess differences in, in chronic pain. Um, and it's also important to note that a lot of these studies, if, if um, uh, the epidurals were inserted, if there was failures in the rectal sheath catheters. What about neurology? So um, Dalton et al. in 2011 described their technique and reported post-op pain and complications and recovery for open cystectomies and uh, RRPs. Um, they didn't really compare rectal sheath catheters to anything, um, but they did show that rectal sheath catheters were effective for pain control. And um, uh, you can see on the graph on the left, their, their pain scores remained below three in the first 72 hours. Um, it's interesting that in the second graph, essentially each color here is, is a different year. So they show that uh, over the four years that the study ran, there was a significant decrease from 2008 to 2011 as experience with rectal sheath catheter was gained. So uh, all the patients, uh, in, in, in initially, all the patients were provided with the PCA as, as a default. And then as the opioid sparing effects of rectal sheath catheters are understood and tested, this went down over time. And this experience is also reflected in the decreased length of stay over time. So initially, radical cystectomies had a, uh, stayed for uh, 17 days, and towards the end of the study, the average was was 11 days. And then for uh, RRPs, it started off as six days, uh, the length of stay, and it went down to three days uh, over the four years. And then uh, this is this is a study carried out here in Vancouver, comparing rectal sheath catheters to thoracic epidurals and open cystectomies, uh, looking at opioid consumption and post-op pain. Uh, interestingly, it's, it's the only study of the ones I've mentioned where they, they placed their rectal sheath catheter surgically rather than with ultrasound guidance preoperatively. It's, it's very little information or data detailing the difference between uh, inserting it surgically versus via ultrasound, but uh, surgical insertion is essentially quicker. Um, there's uh, no chance to intrude on the surgical field accidentally. There's uh, It's more straightforward to master. And um, there there is the, the risk of it maybe leaking into the surgical opening posteriorly. Um, this study suggested that uh, uh, if the rectal sheath catheter was inserted uh, uh, via ultrasound guidance prior to the case, maybe uh, uh, pain control would have been better early on. Because essentially, the study found that rectal sheath catheter had slightly higher pain uh, in the PACU, uh, but afterwards, uh, up until post-op day three, there was no statistical significant difference between uh, epidurals and rectal sheath catheters. Um, the epidural group used less morphine, uh, but statistically, their uh, rectal sheath catheters are found non-inferior based on opioid consumption. Um, the the higher opioid consumption rectal sheath catheters were attributed to a couple of cases of leaking catheters, um, which uh, could uh, could be something to note about surgically inserting the rectal sheath catheter. And it's important to note here that the epidurals used were also uh, only used local anesthetic. Uh, to accurately measure how much opioid consumption was uh, was there post-op, even though our, our typical protocol is actually to, to use both opioids and uh, local anesthetic in the epidurals. Uh, the last anesthetic method I'll be reviewing is the transversus abdominis plane block. So it's, um, it's a new regional uh, block technique uh, providing analgesia to the anterior abdominal wall and peritoneum. And it's, uh, it's first uh, described in 2001 by Rafi et al. Essentially, local anesthetic with or without a, uh, epi is uh, injected into the compartment between the internal oblique and the uh, transversus abdominis muscles. And you get this intercostal nerve block from T7 to T11, as well as um, uh, the subcostal nerve, the iliolingual nerve, and the ilio uh, hypogastric nerve from L1 to L2, all relieved of pain. Um, uh, so the TAPs are, are compared to epidurals and, and various abdominal surgeries uh, and found to be similar in terms of analgesia with um, uh, while avoiding the risks of uh, associated with epidurals. 
So one downside of, of uh, both the rectus sheath and, and the, uh, the tap uh, methods is that they, they only block somatic pain, whereas epidurals block visceral pain. So theoretically, um, which uh, patients experience after a major abdominal surgery. Uh, there was a study that showed that uh, that rectus sheath catheters and taps are actually less effective if a patient has had uh, previous um, a major abdominal surgery or radiation, which essentially plasters the, the fascial layer against the muscle. And so it's harder to find that plane to inject it in. Um, and these studies here uh, in 2018, an RCT comparing tap and uh, epidurals uh, and colorectal surgeries found them equally effective, like I said, with a decreased length of stay for tap. Um, and uh, uh, another study found that um, uh, they they had the lower uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting and lower ileus rates. So again, lower uh, rate, uh, rates of um, uh, side effects typically are attributed to epidurals and, and to opioids while still having adequate pain control. Uh, so these these are the two studies that I found for using TAP for cystectomies. So um, uh, one, uh, Refugia et al., did, they didn't really compare it to anything. They just detailed their approach for radical cystectomies using the TAP block. Uh, they used it for, for all their robot cases and open cases. Uh, and then uh, Robach et al. Uh, compared TAP cystectomies to cystectomies done with no, no TAP. They don't really compare it to epidurals, so it's hard to interpret their data. Um, they mentioned that although epidurals are a mainstay of ERAS protocols, we opted not to use it in our protocol. Um, but either way, comparing it to cystectomies done with only IV analgesia, they found that uh, using TAP, the TAP block decreased opioid consumption uh, on post-op day zero and one. And there was no statistically significant difference in terms of operating time or length of stay. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any studies that compare cystectomies done with TAP to cystectomies done with epidural, which is considered the gold standard. So uh, last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, post-operative um, uh, prescriptions and, and, and opioids prescriptions. So opioid overdoses are a leading cause of accidental mortality, and about half of those are uh, prescription opioids. It's it's difficult to uh, it's a difficult challenge for surgeons to to balance under and over prescribing opioids post op, uh, but according to the AUA uh, in terms of urology, uh, there's a six percent rate of persistent opioid use in opioid naive patients post urology surgeries, and um, studies within both uh, uh, within um, endo urology and minimally invasive and reconstructive and oncology. Uh, urology populations all show that the majority of opioid naive patients may not require postoperative uh, opioid prescription, and uh, with the use of just non-opioid meds, you can probably uh, achieve the same outcomes and substantially reduce morbidity. Um, uh, surgery is becoming a common setting where where opioid naive patients are being introduced to opioids. Um, with uh, surgeons often prescribing patient uh, more pills or uh, uh, prescribing opioids just in case, and to to avoid that phone call that they get to clinic and um, and end up prescribing two to five times more than needed, uh, as reported by the AUA. Um, given that electronic prescriptions exist and it's and it's easy and convenient to prescribe over the phone, and we do it on the ward all the time, where if nurses forget to give a prescription to a patient, we just call it into their pharmacy. Um, we can probably shift away from the default opioid prescriptions. The the six percent rate of persistent opioid use in opioid naive patients is is not insignificant, especially given the number of surgeries we do. Um, many studies show that that if opioids are prescribed, patients typically only use somewhere between four to ten tablets after surgery. If if they're uh, if they're using non opioid pain medications as well, like acetaminophen or NSAIDs, and it's been demonstrated that. Um, uh, what patients take correlate to how much is prescribed. So the, the portion size effect. So Howard et al. showed that for every additional pill prescribed after uh, surgery, pill use increased by 0.5. So if we if we give more pills just, uh, just in case, typically more pills are actually taken by the patient. Uh, if a post-operative opioid prescription is deemed necessary, uh, the AUA suggests that it should be for the, the lowest effective dose and the lowest duration possible. Uh, so this is just some more info in statistics in, in neurology. So a, a study at John Hopkins found that 77% of prescribed post-op opioids after prostate surgeries went unused. 
and um, uh, for uh, open and robotic uh, radical prostatectomies, and only nine percent actually uh, of patients properly disposed of their extra extra pills or extra opioids. Another study looked at various urological surgeries and found that seventy two percent of our post op patients practice opioid keeping, which is essentially possessing any opioids. Um, uh, more than three weeks after surgery or more than four times the duration of the prescription. And uh, most patients didn't know how to dispose of their pills and 68% of them kept them unsecure in their homes. So this shows that uh, we're probably over-prescribing and our patients end up with a stash of, of, un of a controlled substance. The uh, last thing I want to mention is, or show is uh, uh, some studies that portray completely non-opioid approaches to post-op pain. So this study in 2021 looked at robot-assisted cystectomies that underwent a non-opioid protocol. And the study was comparing intracorporeal to extracorporeal urinary diversion. But I wanna, what I wanted to take away is, is in their protocol. So they essentially uh, summarize a lot of the points I made. Is uh, Preoperatively, they give their patients one gram of acetaminophen, 600 milligrams of gabapentin, 600 milligrams of celecoxib, and then uh, at induction, um, they, they induce with, with ketamine and profol with no fentanyl. And then intraoperatively, they give ketamine and dexamethamine infusions and acetaminophen. And then post-op, they get acetaminophen, ketorolac, and gabapentin. Um, and uh, they discharge their patients with, with no regular opioids. Uh, a different study looked at post-op prescriptions in, in stone and kidney stone surgeries. And they randomized giving patients um, either a uh, ketorolac uh, uh, PO or PO oxycodone at discharge and uh, following elective URS or PCNLs. And then they followed up at their pain levels uh, within one week post-op. And they found that there is no difference in terms of uh, satisfaction of pain relief, but ketorolac actually showed lower average pain scores uh, out of 10. Uh, I will say though, the creatinine wasn't really followed up on these patients afterwards. But their their pain control was was uh, was better with ketorolac compared to oxycodone. So uh, uh, to conclude, um, preoperative pain uh, patient education sets expectations. Uh, in person education in the surgeon has been shown to decrease postoperative pain. Um, ketorolac and ketamine have opioid sparing properties, and they've been shown to optimize postoperative pain control while speeding up reco recovery and are safe to use. Um, a combination of NSAIDs, acetaminophen, plus or minus gabapentin is better than any of them alone and uh, in decreasing pain and opioid requirements. And uh, while epidurals are the gold standard for major abdominal surgeries, TAP and recluse catheters have been shown to be non-inferior and they avoid the risks of epidurals and, and decrease opioid consumption. And then uh, opioids are regularly overprescribed in surgical contexts and uh, opioid naive patients may not need that just in case prescription. And uh, we should uh, consider moving forward uh, towards more opioid-free protocols and not defaulting to opioid prescriptions. Thank you.